Today our topic is how can your board use monitoring and monitoring for as a metric framework. We're really fortunate to have Abigail Harrison who is the Associate Director of Digital and Innovation uh, at HALO in Greater Manchester area. She's led the Sulphur Trust Health Foundation Collaborative for the Vincent Network and has, um, I wish it's called Making Safe the focus, uh, it focused on senior leaders and board members and joining Abigail is Francine Thorpe who is the Director of Quality and Innovation at um, NHS Salford uh, Clinical Commissioning Group. She can explain that to you uh, when she's speaking. But she is responsible for leading uh, improving and, uh, and improving the quality of commission services, supporting quality improvement in primary medical services and promoting innovation. Briefly, our uh, agenda is going to be uh, focused on three parts. We're going to start with a Abigail and Francine who will reflect on their experiences with the measurement and monitoring of safety framework with their senior leaders and board members. Then Ross Baker, um, uh, who is uh, of course, our uh, lead here at the University of Toronto and across the country as a quality expert. He will then join them, uh, he'll join them to discuss uh, the, uh, what they learned and uh, how it might apply to uh, us in Canada. And then we'll hear from Ross on his reflection based on the discussion and what we've learned from our other colleagues in the UK and our Canadian collaborative, which was just launched in May. We'll then open it up to you, uh, our members who are listening in, to uh, ask questions. If you have questions along the way, please enter them in the chat box. And uh, we are going to ask you to remember to complete the poll at the end of the call, which has an additional question about um, ideas you may have for other national calls related to the Vincent framework. We'd love to hear from you. And just before I hand this over to Abigail and Francine, I wonder if any of the people who have joined us today are actual board members in healthcare facilities across Canada. And if you are, could you just raise your hand? Do you, Alex? I'm muted. Uh, nobody is muted right now, by the way. Yeah. Hi, it's Tiffany. I have Bruce Bershide with me in Saskatoon. Oh, great. Well, Bruce has drunk the Kool-Aid. He's been through one of our learning sessions. So good to hear from you. Have you there, Bruce? Thanks. Um, Okay, so let us hand this over to Abigail and, uh, and let's proceed with making safety visible. Abigail? Abigail, can you hear us? Okay, this is a bit of a problem. Uh, uh, Ross, maybe you could just speak to what, what has sort of brought us to this point. Have you, have you made it? Sorry, everybody, we're having a bit of trouble with this uh, audio. Alex has just gone down the hall to find Ross and 
set up his audio if it's not working. Jenny, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, Ross. Please carry on. Okay, so uh, just just to provide a, a bit of background, uh, many people on the call are familiar with this this uh, evolution that we're seeing in Canada, which mirrors similar changes in England, um, the United States, and elsewhere, trying to engage boards around quality and safety. And it was only 10 years ago that the role of the board in terms of quality and safety was really an open question in many organizations across the country. And then uh, with the um, increasing knowledge about safety and quality incidents and the recognition that boards had a role in, in helping to organize and manage and direct the quality and safety plans in organizations across the country, boards began to become much more involved in safety and quality. And so I, I think we see now um, the development of board quality committees, uh, quality agendas that the board approves, in, at a regional or local level across the country, and increased reporting of quality and safety performance in many organizations. But I think in many corners of the country, there's still a concern about how do we get the boards fully engaged on these issues. Many board members uh, don't have very deep backgrounds around clinical work and the quality and safety issues, which we all know are complex questions in our healthcare organizations. And the work that's gone on uh, in, in England and Scotland in the last several years around using this new framework for measuring and monitoring safety has an impact on the front line, but importantly, um, some interesting uh, work that gives us a sense of how this new framework can help to engage uh, those who are involved in the governance of healthcare organizations. So we've asked Abigail and Francine to really share that experience with us then we'll have an opportunity to discuss the ways in which that experience really reflects on our opportunities in Canada. So Virginia, I think that's a little background about uh, why we're on this call today, and hopefully Abigail's now av available to give us, uh, give us more detail about their experience uh, in Manchester. Okay. Thanks, Ross, very much. Abigail is here, and um, Abigail, over to you. Can we? Okay. Abigail, press. Mute off. I can hear you now. Oh, hi. I'm here. Sorry. My phone disconnected, and so I was put on mute again when I called back in. Okay. So, uh, Abigail, just one moment. I uh, could I ask everybody to, uh, because of our audio problem, we need everybody who's not named Abigail to uh, <laughs> just sit quietly. Thanks. And, okay. okay, over so, to you, Abigail. So okay, excellent. I'm so, I'm so sorry, everybody, for these technical problems. It's entirely my fault that I got stuck in some awful traffic and wasn't able to, to set up. Um, so it's very unusual, but let's make this worth everybody's while anyway. You've been waiting for it for a while for us now. Um, so we're really delighted to have been asked to talk about the work that we've done um, in Greater Manchester using the measurement and monitoring of safety framework. And hopefully we could just share some of our learning about how um, to really use the framework with boards and some of the key things that we found that works and some of the kind of questions and things that we've explored. So just as a bit of background, um, we started this just shortly after the framework was published. We realized that clearly there was something really in this and it was a really, um, you know, advanced our thinking in how we thought about safety. And we started a conversation with Charles Vincent about how we would be able to use the framework, specifically working with boards. And we were able to get some funding from the Health Foundation, which is a charity in England, in the UK. Um, to run a collaborative program where we brought 10 hospital boards together um, over three learning sessions, together with also the boards of their commissioning organizations. And really, we were just looking to 
explore what the framework meant for them and how they could use it. Um, and we had this focus on you looking at safety and using the framework across the system. And I don't know, Francine, if you want to just give a bit of a reflection on who we had in the room and why that was important. Sure, yeah. So, um, Salford, which is the, uh, the city of Salford, our local economy, um, we took uh, board members from our clinical commissioning group. So, we had um, three general practitioners, our lay members, um, so our non-executive directors, um, we have two lay members on our governing body that are particularly interested in, in quality and safety. One is a, a governing body nurse and the other one is a secondary care clinician that has specific responsibility around quality and safety. Interestingly, we also took our director of finance. We wanted to, um, to make sure that the finances were linked up with the uh, safety and quality agenda um, and our chief accountable officer and myself. And then from the hospital, um, our hospital provides all of our inpatient services, but also our community services in Salford. So um, it, it's a large provider of services for us. Um, so their director of nursing, their medical director, um, a couple of their um, non-executive directors on the board. Uh, Mute on. Director of finance and their director of strategy. So we had very senior representation across the organizations. And um, for, for our Salford economy, we also included um, a couple of representatives from our local authority. Um, so the council, the local council in Salford is responsible for um, commissioning social care services. Um, so we felt it important that we included um, representatives from social care given the direction of travel um, here in England around trying to integrate health and social care services. So those were the representatives um, from, from our economy that, that were part of the programme. And I think it's fair to say that it really challenged our thinking in relation to safety and safety improvement, um, particularly uh, the, the notion that um, safety in England is very much focused on the safety of hospitals. So it enabled us to have a conversation about um, how, how safety um, and quality um, should be taken forward, thinking about a whole system rather than just hospital-based services. So I think that's probably as much as I wanted to say for that introductory slide. Abigail, I think over to you again. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Fancy. And just so, so um, we just wanted to mention that because this did add a, an extra layer of complexity, I guess, to the way that we've used the framework. So we've been really looking at what it means across a whole system. So the first thing that we did, and I guess our first bit of key learning, you're not you're not supposed to be able to read all of the slides, but. We had a, a really long lead in time to the work that we did because obviously when we're working with boards and senior leaders, um, it takes a lot of time just to get dates in the diaries and to make sure that people are all available because we really wanted all of our senior leaders to be able to come together. But also we realized that it was really important for us to invest quite a lot of time in understanding where we were currently at. So this framework you can see in front of you is the maturity matrix that some of you may have seen. And this was developed by some of the authors of the framework, and it enables you to self-assess where you're currently at. So it has these different, um, you know, pathological, reactive, bureaucratic, proactive, and generative. So it enables you to have a conversation as a team and really understand um, where you're at with each of the domains of the framework. And I think this is really interesting because actually there are a lot of assumptions and we were able to challenge um, you know, how, how advanced we really were in some of these domains. And I think probably everybody, and it may be similar with you, will find that we're much more comfortable in the past harm um, domain of the framework. So we feel comfortable with it. We use a lot of past harm data. We understand how we use that. And same sometimes with measures of reliability. But when we started getting to sensitivity to operations, anticipation and preparedness and integration and, and learning, and we were certainly less advanced, I'd say, and less, and less confident. So I really would recommend really taking the time before you jump into the framework to actually really focus in on how you currently measure and monitor safety and making sure that everybody's got a really shared understanding of that before you go on to think about how you might do things differently. And so that was our kind of first step, and we spent quite a lot of time on that. 
we then thought about how we were going to frame the framework, which is um, maybe um, you know, a crude way of putting it. And I, and I don't know how Charles Vincent feels about this. So Charles was um, the key faculty on the program that we ran, and he was involved um, in putting the bid together um, and delivering the program. Um, and you know, he often says that he knew that he needed to make something simple that fit onto kind of one slide. But we simplified this even further because we took the different domains of the framework so it takes us through path harm, reliability, sensitivity to operations, anticipation and preparedness, and integration and learning, and simplified that even further into this notion of the past, the present, and the future. Now, this fit with us because we were having three learning sessions, so we fit them around. The first one was about the past, the second one was about the present, and the third one was about the future. But also we found that this was a really simple concept in terms of us thinking differently. Um, and we realized that there was a real potential here for this framework to really open up the way we thought about safety. So we framed this as a, a way for us to move away from a preoccupation with looking into the past, so most of our data, our energy, our time was spent looking into the past and thinking about the present, so how we understand data in real time, and then how we look into the future. Um, and I found personally when I'm talking about the framework with people, you know, if people have the time to read it, to get to grips with all the different domains, then having those five domains is great. But actually the really simple way of thinking about this, that it's the past, the present, and the future, really helps us frame our sessions. And so I was going to just talk a little bit about some of the content we use and some of the key things that we found. So in our first session, we looked at the past. So this was taking the elements of the framework around past harm and how we use past harm data in our measurement and monitoring of safety. Um, and what we found there is that even though this is the realm in which we are kind of comfortable, actually there was still an awful lot that we could do to improve the way that we use our past harm data. And one of the key things that came out that I'll, we'll talk about, uh, again about later was this issue of moving from assurance to inquiry. So certainly in this country, um, we're very driven by the kind of regulatory system and this need to provide assurance and we use our data for assurance often. And so we really wanted to move to a model of using our data for inquiry. Um, and we talked about other things like having patient-centered measures, having system-wide measures, really understanding our different data sources. So that was the past, and I won't labor that because I think probably everyone's familiar with that. So then when we talked about the present, we were bringing in um, elements of the framework around reliability and sensitivity to operations. So in here, we talked about exploring the different kind of measures that we had of reliability, and actually we found that we did have quite a number of measures of reliability. Um, we talked about flow within and between systems, and we talked about staffing as well. Um, we talked about technologies, and we talked about behaviors. And this is one of the really key um, learning points, I think, that came around this idea of sensitivity to operations. But actually, firstly, there's an awful lot of things in the framework here that actually most hospitals, most um, care organizations are already doing, but we're not necessarily looking at them as a safety issue. So if we think about understanding our staffing levels, if we think about flow, um, often we've got great ways of, of measuring these in real time, but we're not necessarily linking that into our safety information. And um, so that's one thing that, that we really started to pick up, that we have a lot of this information, but we're not necessarily using it um, in the context of safety, if that makes sense. So we started to try and integrate some of this data together and think about actually what does it look like if we looked at our staffing data and our, and our information around flow next to some of our safety outcomes. And then the second key thing here is around this difference between data and behaviors. So actually in the measurement and monitoring of safety framework, it talks about all sorts of different things. So, and, and some of those are about having data. So how do we actually in real time measure and, and view and respond to the data that we have, the hard data. But then some of that is around behaviors. Um, so actually this isn't just about using data, and um, this is about the kind of behaviors that we have to monitor safety. And um, so we talked about um, checklists, we talked about safety huddles and leadership kind of walk rounds and safety culture. And actually all of these things are kind of more related to safety behaviors. Um, and actually one of the key interventions um, 
that some of our leaders were really interested in and that they tested is called the onion. And there's a picture of an onion there for this reason. And you, you may have heard about it, and I think it's in the framework. Um, and this is where, on a daily basis, there's an opportunity for a multidisciplinary group of staff to come together and talk about any potential safety issues and respond to them in real time. So I think that was a real key learning for some of our leaders around um, making themselves available so that they can action safety issues in real time um, rather than there being kind of prolonged processes or, you know, weeks in between actions. And in terms of our working across the system, um, some of our leaders agreed that actually um, leaders from different organizations across a whole health system would have an opportunity on a daily basis to connect and talk about safety. Um, so that was interesting in the present section. Then in our third learning session, we talked about the future. So this is all about anticipation and preparedness. Um, and one of the key things here clearly is this move from lagging to leading measures. And Charles often talks about, you know, when I've heard him talk, one of the key differences between healthcare and other high-risk safety issues was that they focus just as much on their leading indicators, their indicators that tell them what's going to happen in the future as they do on their lagging indicators. And actually, we were really in a position where most of our energy and time, as I said, was focused on our lagging indicators, the things that had already happened. So there was a whole change in thinking there about how we actually start to place just as much importance actually on data that are giving us a signal of the future, um, as well as data that are telling us about what happened in the past. Um, we also talked about things that we needed to consider, such as early warning systems. We talked about culture. We talked about um, predictive modeling techniques that you can use, and there isn't time to go into these today, but I guess just to flag that there are um, things like failure mode effect analysis, and there are actual models that you can use to make predictions about high-risk pathways. And we talked about some of the simple things that you can do. So if you think about, even in the simplest terms, if you use a statistical process control and you display your data over time, um, which many boards will look at data over time, you're able to use that actually to predict what will happen um, in the next month or the next couple of months. Um, so there was some kind of interesting learning there and really started to push ourselves, I guess, to, to use our data in a different way. But the key really, um, and Charles often talks about this, is, is in bringing all of this together. So I think what was really important for us that this isn't about just focusing on each of these domains separately. And the key is really about bringing all of this information together. Um, and anticipation and preparedness um, as a domain is a really good example of this, because actually in order to anticipate and prepare for safety issues that may occur in the future, we need to understand our past harm data. We need to have measures of reliability that signal how our processes are running, how reliable our care is. We need to understand what we're learning on a daily basis from safety issues and bring all of this together to anticipate and prepare what will happen in the future. And so that was really key learning for us that really we needed to have systems in place where we brought all of these different information together. And we've actually got a dashboard, which I'll show you um, in a moment. So. Um, after, this, after the initial work that we did, Francine and the team at Salford went on to, to do a program of work. So I'll just hand over to Francine to talk through what they did next. Okay, thanks, Abigail. Um, so I think um, the, the board members from my organisation and our, and our local hospital um, wanted to um, make sure that we built on the learning that, that we'd undertaken through this, this programme. And we're really clear that we wanted it to make a difference in our local health and care system. And I think just to set the context, at the time that we, um, we undertook the, the Making Safety Visible programme, within Salford we were going through a significant change which was that um, we come together as partners acro across the system um, to commission services differently and our um, social care providers, so our social workers and care homes were transitioning to be provided by our local hospital which was quite a big change for us, um, uh, a, a, a really big change and what we wanted to do was to make sure that the learning that we'd undertaken through, um, through this program underpinned the development of our integrated care system. 
So I think what we, we're hoping for is that um, over time, through working um, through elements of the programme, we can demonstrate that an integrated health and care system is a safer system. That's our ambition. Um, how we framed that was that we wanted to be the safest health and social care system in the UK by 2022. Um, so that's a little way away, um, but we felt that it was a, a, a really bold ambition. Um, some of the difficulties we faced in, in demonstrating that, as I alluded to earlier, are that many of our safety measures um, that, that we see nationally that are nationally benchmarked relate to hospital care, and what we found through undertaking this program is that there is little information about other parts of the system, so we're trying to, to work on that. So essentially, we came up with um, um, the notion that we are safe for Salford programme, which was a, as a result of the learning. Um, as commissioners, we put some money against this, hence my, um, my reference to making sure our director of finance was on the, uh, the original programme. So we managed to persuade him to, um, um, to put just short of £850,000 over a two-year programme, so not an insignificant amount of money, um, to this improvement work. Um, and we've commissioned HALO to work with us on, on driving some of these improvements. So I won't go into this in too much detail, but essentially um, we have uh, three enabling work streams. The first one is leadership. Um, we recognise that as um, system-wide leaders um, at, at the highest level in our organisations, we needed to make sure that uh, other senior leaders working um, operate, operationally within our systems were aware of the framework and the learning that we'd um, undergone and the challenge that it gave us to our thinking. So we've got a programme running to, um, based on the Making Safety Visible programme, which um, is, is working with a, a cohort of 30 leaders across the system. The second one there we referenced is around culture, and this was a real um, talking point for us, I guess, through the original workshops, in that um, different parts of the health system talk about safety in different ways, and certainly in the social care system, um, safety means, um, means very different things. So the, the culture piece is really trying to understand what a safety, what safety cultures we have in different parts of our system and whether we can create a common view of safety and take that forward. The third enabler there is around intelligence and again this references the fact that uh, how, how we use data and how we try and um, make data meaningful across a system rather than just focusing on organisational data. Um, so we, we're trying to build a, me a measurement system that asks that answers the question, is our integrated health and, and, and care system getting safer? And um, Abigail will come back to that um, in a moment. And then the three areas where we are looking to focus our improvement work um, are highlighted um, in the last part of the slide here. So um, these are around safer handover, safer medicines, and safer care homes. And we came to the conclusion that we needed to um, spend some um, time and energy focusing on these areas through some work that we did as part of the program. So some of the clinicians that were involved in the program did some mortality reviews to try and identify what the key themes were um, that, that came out of uh, looking, at, looking for harm um, within, within a, a patient's journey. And I guess most of you won't be surprised that, that those are the themes we came up with, particularly around handover from one, one care setting to another um, and around medicines. We have a particular um, issue here in Salford and uh, I guess uh, in other parts of the UK around our care home sector. Uh, care homes are independent providers of health care. I'm talking about residential and nursing care homes here uh, that look after the most frail uh, and vulnerable um, citizens um, in our economy. And we recognise that very little work had been done in care homes around safety and safety improvement and we wanted to, to make sure that we were focusing um, on that sector. So those are the three improvement areas that, uh, that we have, and we have um, work streams and work stream leads um, taking that, that program forward. So I think um, th this next slide really illustrates um, 
how we are encouraging leaders across the system um, to, to think about safety in a very different way. Um, so really to think about how, how as a system do, um, do, does safety and safety improvement um, need to feature. Um, and Abigail mentioned flow, I think, earlier on in her, in her presentation. And we recognize that, 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 as I said earlier, patients have journeys across um, from their home into hospital into a care home or back into a home setting. Um, and often when you look at safety at an individual organizational level, you can try and make safety improvements in a hospital setting, for example, but occasionally or perhaps more frequently than occasionally, when you make improvements in safety in one part of the system, it can have unintended consequences on other parts of the system. And I think we've picked that up through some of the work we've done around flow, moving patients um, out of hospital and back in to community settings. So we can expand on that a little bit more if people are interested. So um, I think we're recognizing that um, we need to focus on not just looking backwards over our shoulders in the rear view mirror about safety and what has gone wrong and how, how we can put things right and learn from things that have gone wrong to really trying to focus on how we use data and intelligence and um, the uh, uh, leadership to, to drive forward the questions about are, are we safe today, is our care and health and care system safe today and can we predict um, when we're making changes to our health and care system whether it will be safe in the future. Um, so I think uh, the, the, the way that we traditionally look at safety is through, uh, we call it RAG ratings, I think you call it traffic lights, um, measures of, of safety and different indicators. Many of them are linked to national targets. For example, uh, we have a national target here in the UK around all patients that attend an accident in the emergency department should be seen and treated within four hours. Um, that's a real key focus for our unscheduled care system. Um, and we measure that routinely and monitor it and a whole range of indicators related to that. Um, but what we're trying to understand is, well, what leads us, what, what leads uh, the, us to have issues in that, in that particular um, element of the system so that we're not just focusing on these national indicators that are regularly shared and benchmark, med, benchmarked and we're looking at other parts of the system. So we're changing the question to are we safe, so tell us that we're safe, to, tell us that we're safe, tell us that, that we are safe, to what can we learn about safety and how, how, can, we, um, how can we identify whether we, we're improving um, on safety and whether um, we are getting safer. So I think those are the, the key learning points from my perspective. And I think Abigail is just going to take us through some specific work that we've done around measures. Thanks, Francie. We're going to have a very conversation, so we're going to come to the next. I do feel like we've just been talking about all the different things we've done, but just so you can see what we're doing, kind of the combination of what we've got. Abigail, you're, you're cutting out on us a bit. Oh, am I? Can you hear me, can you hear me now? That's I haven't better. moved anywhere. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry, I just moved slightly. So, so this is the culmination of the work that we've done. So Francine talked about some of these key changes in the way that we've thought about safety with our leaders. So we're moving away from this kind of looking at the traffic light system and performance measures and trying to think about improvement. We're trying to use these elements of the framework to think about how we bring different data sources together. So I'll just quickly talk through this. It's a good example of how we've done this. And this was designed to be used by senior leaders and board members across the system in Salford. So the measure at the top here is a measure of past harm. So this is our first measure that signals how we've been doing in the past. And clearly this links to this past harm domain of the framework. But actually, because this is presented over time, it enables us to understand whether or not we're in and it does enable us to predict actually what's going to happen in the next month. We can see a trend occurring so we can get a sense of, of where we're going. The second measure then explores that further and starts to look at how that measure is actually being um, at what is represented in there across the, across the locality. So this map is actually the same data that is in that first measure. 
So again, thinking about the framework, it's really starting to broaden this out and look at the variation that we have within a system. This is a much more sophisticated way of using our past time data than a simple table that gives us a number. Then the third measure there is actually starting to get us into a predictive space. So this is actually a measure um, of reliability of our systems that gives us a signal of what might happen. So this is a a key combination of medicines um, that actually, when got wrong, can cause harm. So this is a measure that gives us a signal of how reliable, um, of how reliable the system actually is performing at the moment, and gives us a kind of predictive signal. Um, and then this fourth measure here is about medicines reconciliation. So again, this is a measure of reliability. So what we're doing here is bringing these measures of past harm variation across the system together with measures of reliability and measures which predict what our performance might be in this issue, which is medicines on here in the future. And then we've got another example here, which is false, where again we've used the same model of bringing together past harm data, looking at variation across the system with measures um, which signal system reliability. Um, and which give us signals of, of the potential. So here, if you look at the fourth measure, it's looking at um, predictive risk factors related to falls in the population. Um, and the idea with this dashboard is that senior leaders will use it to generate conversation. And the, the biggest change that we're trying to engender here and using data in this different way is that we move from this model of assurance, which I talked about, um, to inquiry. Um, and Charles works with us a lot around this. How do we move away from looking at our data and thinking about safety data as something that we're looking to just give us the answer, you know, are we safe? Tell us that we're safe. Is everything okay? So actually recognizing that it's much more complex than that, and I think the measurement and monitoring safety framework in these different domains just shows us how complex safety is. So actually we're using our data, data to ask questions, to have a conversation, to inquire, and to keep learning and keep having the conversation rather than just to kind of kick that box and give ourselves some assurance. Um, so that's the journey that we've really been on with our leaders to start to use data in a different way. Um, and um, I think so far, so we've, so we've just, this dashboard has just been, been developed in the last couple of months. And so we're just still in the testing mode at the minute, but it's starting to generate some different conversations. Um, about our information um, at the board level, which we're pleased with. Um, so I think that's all the content from us. Um, I know we've whizzed through lots of different things there, but I'd be interested to see if anybody's got any questions. I think uh, before we do that, I want to thank you for that, but I'm going to pass it over to Ross, because I think he wants to start the discussion with you. Okay, great. Yeah. So thanks so much, uh, Abigail and Francine. Uh, it, this is really interesting. Uh, it's sort of a fascinating sort of journey that you're on. And uh, I want to ask you some questions that sort of both um, drill down on what your experience has been in using this approach to think about safety and to create a conversation uh, with senior leaders and boards around safety. Um, and also then to think about this in the translation to the Canadian context, because our boards are somewhat different than your boards. Our boards have larger mm -hmm. number of um, lay people and um, what you would call non-executives, and we would call mm -hmm. you know external members on them. And so the challenge for understanding complex safety issues, I think, is even higher in our environments than it is mm -hmm. in in your environments. So maybe maybe just to start this conversation. Uh, I really like those uh, examples you had of trying to integrate different types of information from the different perspectives around safety, not only thinking about past harm, but thinking about um, reliability and sensitivity to operations. And maybe you could say mm -hmm. a little bit about how you approach that for these issues, the issues of medication safety and the issues of falls. Mm -hmm. Was it was it a challenge? Was it a lot of work to, to work out what information you tried to put here, and 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 to create this sort of story, if you will, about the various issues? And then how did how did you help the conversation develop about you know what should we do with this? Where should we focus? What changes might we yeah. make 
in the system. So a little more detail on that, I think, would be very helpful for us because I think we already feel like we're drowning our boards in complexity, and, and there may be some people on the, mm. on the call who say, gee, how is this possible to really have this conversation because you've really opened the view much wider, but that's made it harder at the same time for us to, to think about how to, how to use this information effectively. Yeah, so, so that's a really good point. And, and I think the, the point I made at the beginning about us simplifying this even further to this idea of past, present, and future was actually driven down to that because, you know, there's so inf much information and it sounds like your boards are even more complex in that way. But actually, we realized that there's just a really simple mindset shift here. So even if we didn't do anything different, if we just started thinking about what does this information tell me about today, what does this information tell me about what might happen in a couple of weeks' time, even just that as a, as a little shift in thinking would, yeah. we hoped, would have an impact even if you know we, everybody didn't understand every single domain of the framework and we weren't you know doing a whole review of the organization even if we would just if we just took this idea of thinking about the past present and the future um so that was the first thing that we did but you asked about you know looking at these specific issues of medicines and falls and actually that that is one thing that is challenging with the framework because if you read the the document it talks about safety just in general as a big is a big picture issue and it has all these examples. But it's quite difficult to start to conceptualize something and think about something when you're just thinking about everything. So we tried to choose specific focus areas to help people have something to connect this to. So, okay, if we thought about falls, so let's think about the idea of falls. What are, what are our kind of past time measures? So how would we understand how we're gonna be doing for falls in a year's time? And it, it gave you something to kind of think hang the framework too, I guess. But it also does complicate matters. So what we found recently when we've been having these conversations with teams um, and brings up the um, dashboard again, so Falls is a great example, we were working with uh, senior leaders and content experts and we were trying to actually get measures for which map to each domain of the framework and we had a conversation about past harm, what are our measures of past harm for Falls. That was a really simple conversation. Everybody knew what the measures were. Then we talk about, well, reliability, how would we know how reliable we are, you know, our processes are. Then it started to get a little bit more difficult and we maybe think about, well, you know, maybe risk assessment, we do full risk assessment, that might give us a signal. So that was okay. And then when we started to talk about anticipation and preparing and sensitivity to operations, well, how would we understand in real time and anticipation and preparedness? Some of the conversations we had were, were literally falling apart because it just got so difficult actually to think about those specific issues in that way. And we had the same thing with medicines. When we got onto this idea of sensitive to it got more it got more difficult to start to understand what we were meaning. Um, but I think in the in the simplest sense, the best description you know I've had of sensitive to operations is just imagine that you're walking onto a imagine that you're walking onto a ward. I think how would you know right then and there whether or not you were safe? So probably a great exercise to do, and I think which some of our boards do is just to like get out there and actually live that experience. Because um, I think we can talk about past time and we can talk about reliability, you know, in a in a boardroom. But when we're thinking about sensitivity to operations, a lot of that is behaviour. So I think actually getting out there and asking that question, well, how would you know? And we did this recently actually in the in the program that we're running in Salford. We had a leadership cohort, and actually, when it came to sensitivity to operations, we just sent them out to different settings in the morning with the question of how would you know how safe this environment is today, and that was their way that they were learning about learning about that. And um, so, I don't know if that was a helpful answer, but that, that's how we found the most helpful way. Yeah. Yeah. Of the framework. Yeah. I that's very helpful. There's a there's an ambulance in the background, I think, there, so we're, we're, we're getting <laughs> that's, that That's, that's my, my end, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Um, so the, the, what, I, what I really am interested in is you, you've had this early sort of, as you say, testing experience uh, with, with this. Um, what's your thinking about how you're going, what's the evolution on this? Are you thinking that this may get, there may be more measures or there may be uh, initiatives that you're starting, that you're tracking over time. So 
that, you know, taking falls, for example, are you going to be looking at the uh, extent to which you are completing risk assessments um, on patients uh, in care homes and, and elsewhere? Um, what's, what's, the, what's the evolution of this? Because one could imagine it could quickly get out of hand in terms of the number of things you're looking at. On the other hand, we know these issues are complex. There aren't simple answers to them. Mm. Can I pick that yeah. up? Um, yeah. Frank, yeah, Frank, yeah, so, so, um, so I think what we don't want to do, Ross, is make a, an industry around uh, different measures. I think these, these are a starter for 10 for us. We've had a lot of clinical engagement around, around some, some of these dashboards, and still clinicians would want to put something else on, on, these, on these dashboards. Right. I, suppose, I suppose in terms of evolution and how, how we will know we are, we are a safer system is I, I would like to see that um, the that, that plans, uh, the that, that operational plans that parts of the system have um, reflect safety and, and, and safety indicators. I would like to see that when we're talking about um, uh, a change in the way that we the, the way that we deliver services that though the, any 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 plans around that contain um, uh, um, information about that, that people have thought about what are the what are the safety implications for doing this so it, it's about um, I, I would hope to see that uh, the leaders and clinicians and uh, people working in all parts of our health and care system um, how can evidence that safety is part of their thinking. So I don't think we particularly want to focus on a whole range of measures um, and, and, and create an industry out of that. But what would be good to see is that, that, that people in individual services or um, in individual parts of our system recognize safety and measure it themselves, albeit um, maybe in a very small and simple way, um, and acknowledge that, that they are paying attention to, um, to look at um, past harm, is care safe today, and will care be safe in the future? Yeah, and, and so that gets to the, uh, the next question, really, which is around the alignment of, of the work that's going to go on on the front line uh, with this kind of thinking and the work that's going on at a leadership and board level so that the, there's a sort of a, a flow back and forth from what people are learning at the front mm -hmm. line to inform leadership and board, but also leadership and board uh, able to provide some direction to, um, as you say, to, to not sort of go off on an endless measurement um, sort of uh, routine, but to, to really focus on things that are going to make a difference. Any thoughts about mm -hmm. that, how you're going to do that? Um, Abigail, do you want to pick that up, or, or shall I? Yeah, I don't, well, I don't know. Have you got thoughts on it, Francine? Or I can so, so, so in, terms of, in terms of that connection between um, our leadership and the front line, again, this, this kind of links back to what Abigail was saying earlier. So um, having our senior leaders um, doing regular visits to the front line, so um, uh, uh, quality walk arounds or um, visits to different parts of, uh, of the system, asking those questions really um, um, is something that, that we're pushing forward with. So um, engage with, with members, members of, uh, of our boards being, being part of, uh, of those visits and having the opportunity to, to talk to frontline staff and get them to, to talk them through how they, um, how they approach safety and, and safety improvement. And then I guess um, the, the, other, the other thing that, that, we're, that we're trying to move forward is, I don't, I don't know whether, I'm sorry, I don't know whether the system is the same in, in, in Canada. So we've got quite a big divide here between um, hospital clinicians and our general practitioners, so our primary medical services, very, you know, they're employed very yeah. differently. Yeah. Um, so, the, is it same? Right. So, the, the whole handover piece is really helping us um, to enable some of those clinical conversations. So, instead of hospital consultants being really frustrated about the fact that general practitioners won't act on their instructions and, and um, GPs being really frustrated about the fact that hospital clinicians are sending patients back to them requiring lots of things to be done. We're, we're trying to facilitate um, clinical networks where th those issues are discussed and, um, and worked through and give clinicians the opportunity, I suppose, to walk in one another's shoes, really, and, and appreciate the, the perspective from, from from different different um, 
different parts of the system. And I have to say, in the 12 months that we've been doing this work, that's had some real benefits. So we see less of the blaming other parts of the system and more of a shared willingness to want to work on improvement together. And it, 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 we recognise it is the start of a really early journey. I mean, I'm glad you said we are on a journey. We very much feel that. We certainly haven't um, gone that far down the journey and we've got a long way to go. But those are some of the, the things that we would be looking to see um, more signs of, that clinical engagement and a real willingness to work on improvement projects together. And HALO are helping us to facilitate that. Yeah, so I, I think that's really interesting. So your, your focus on safety and quality has had numerous additional benefits in terms of giving people a, a sense of how the system works or doesn't work together and what they might do and, and, and opportunities for them to get engaged in that in, in very concrete yeah. ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so we have a question from one of our participants who's asking, who says she really loves these um, examples of measurement. Are there others that, that you've developed as well that you might share? Yeah, so we also, um, so, so what we did, because um, the Salford group had identified these two issues in medicines as falls as issues that were relevant across the whole system, but we have also created um, two other dashboards which aren't here actually, one which looks at this issue of sensitivity to operations, so we have a dashboard that looks similar to this that incorporates staffing, flow data, and kind of again is looking at how we understood that in the past and then how we have measures of reliability and prediction within that. Um, and that, that's um, been more difficult to do. So, so these are quite <laughs> early stages. I guess the medicines and the falls are the ones that we're ready for sharing. Okay, yeah. um, so, so, but we have attempted to do this. So what we've been saying to people is actually don't just look at this information around medicine. Go and have a look at this sensitivity to operations data as well. So actually when you're thinking about medication safety and these issues, you know, we've got the reliability and the measures of past harm and the predictive stuff there, but also go and have a look at what's going on in the system around staffing levels, around um, flow, around admissions to various parts of the system, because actually that information needs to be viewed alongside this. Um, so we do, so we have been trying to make it clear that actually we've, we have to use that those data together. Um, the reason that they're not on that we haven't got those measures on the same dashboard is because actually we need to look at the same data, whether we're looking at falls or medicines or another issue. It's all the same data around staffing and flow that we'd, that we'd be looking at. And we also have another dashboard which we're planning to put, to put together around um, behaviours. So, you know, I talked about this issue of there's all these behaviours actually that we might want to try and understand. So we have another dashboard that we're developing where we're going to bring together all of the data that we've got around culture. Um, and any data that we might have on reliability of key behaviours like checklists, for example. Um, and also we've talked about signing up to safety behaviour pledges, like across Salford we'll all do safety huddles or we'll all do um, leadership kind of walk rounds or, you know, whatever, they're, in they're not developed yet. Um, but we'll have something that brings some of that quality of information together. So we're happy to share as it, as it goes, but we're not all quite yeah. ready yet. Yeah, no, appreciate that. I mean, and we, we're thankful to uh, get your insights at this point of the, of the, uh, of the learning journey. Um, I really love this idea that you're sort of translating the safety work into really more specific and behavioral measures because I think often our discussions about culture are quite abstract and, and uh, not very specific. Mm. So I, I recognize we only have a couple of minutes left, and Virginia, I think we should open this up if anybody has any other questions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, the three of you, Abigail, Francine, and Ross, for that really interesting discussion. Um, uh, are there any questions uh, like that? Hey, so the Mute off. From the background noise, there are uh, lines are open. If anybody has questions, uh, ask. I'm going to ask a question that we had from Tiffany Blair, uh, wondering if there was any possibility to get access uh, dashboards. Abigail, your Halo dashboards are very interesting people. 
Sorry, what was that? I don't, my, the sound went terrible. But your for me. Your dashboard. Uh, is there any possibility oh, to so, access uh, those? Uh, yeah, so at the minute, um, that's, um, it's an online platform that's accessible for um, for the team in Salford at the minute, and then they're, they're just still in, in development, but we'd be happy to share the slides with everybody. Um, and then they are actually, so we weren't able to say, but they are actually interactive dashboards. We click on them and you can see various things. So what I'll do is I'll go back and ask the team what level of access we can give out, because I'm not sure how how um, effective it is in terms of the way to find it, but I will, I will certainly find out and I will, and we will share with you as much as we can. Thanks. Colleen Kennedy has a question here. She asks, I'm curious, as you started the work to socialize the idea prior to working on this journey, what was the response? Did you face resistance? What are your key learnings around this phase? And I would say, Abigail or Francine could answer this. Um, I'm happy to pick that that up. Fran uh, there's Francine here. So um, I, I think there was a, an element of resistance, um, but we quite quickly overcame that. And I think the, the reason why we did it on reflection is um, by focusing on, on the things that really irritate clinicians. So this notion of handover being a real issue for um, clinicians across our system and a recognition that that is often where um, safety issues occur. Um, and, and also medicines was something that we were able to engage um, uh, clinicians and, and staff from all parts of the sector. Because we were a little bit concerned that we, we wanted to make sure that we engage with social care, but the fact that they provide care to, uh, as I said, frail older people living in nursing and residential care homes, those two issues really resonated with, 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 um, with that group of staff as well. So I think the way that we overcame it was by focusing on, on things that, that, that were real frustrations to them in their day-to-day -day work, but also were things that when you aggregate the issues up, you could clearly see were a real safety um, and quality issue, which meant that our senior leaders and, and board members were bought into it as well. Uh, <laughs> it's as if we were there. Um, so I think we're at the end of our hour here, and I don't see any more questions in the chat box or in the Q&A uh, that haven't been answered. So I just want to thank you both again.